venture capital kills more companies than it actually builds. Because oftentimes venture capitalists invest in a company and you know it's doing 10 million in revenue and they're growing 50% year over year. But for VCs, that's not enough. You need to be growing 100% a year over year, 200% year over year. You need to be getting towards a billion dollar company. And you have an entrepreneur sitting there like, dude, my company's doing 10 million in revenue. This is terrific. We're profitable. And the VC says, no, we got to pour more money on the fire. They feed the founder's ego and then everything goes up in flames. The startup investment landscape is changing, and world-class companies are being built outside of Silicon Valley. We find them, talk with them, and discuss the upside of investing in them. Welcome to Upside. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Upside Podcast, the first podcast finding upside outside of Silicon Valley. I'm Jay Klaus, and I'm accompanied by my co-host, Mr. Twitter Master himself, Eric Hornung. I don't know that a Twitter Master would have 419 total followers. I think you are very good at Twitter. You're not great at personal brand and personal messaging and positioning. Man, that compliment really turned into a critique of me very quickly. Well, I was actually trying to compliment you on how well you've been manning the Twitter since issue one of the update and during our panel at South by Southwest. Do you think I get workers comp if I get arthritis in my thumbs from this podcast? Workers comp from you. The podcast? I'll just take it from you. (laughs) Yes. No, not at all. This is your own fault for not using your laptop in that room and just typing. Yeah, that was a mistake. But I'm a loud typer and That's one reason. The other reason is I didn't think about it. So two very valid reasons for why I didn't type the live tweet, why I did it on my phone, which I hated. You've also taught me quite a bit about how threads work. You're very good at threads and how to structure things. All you have to do, Jay, is spend way too much time on Twitter and you learn these things. (laughs) I'm trying to spend more time on Twitter. It's it's a it is a point of emphasis for me right now is spending more time on Twitter with upside also with my own stuff because I am a tad bit selfish yet but I am trying to do more because Twitter is so much more impactful than I realized and that's all due to the podcast is how I'm realizing this you know what the move is you do it in between sets while you're working out and instead of running on like the road or something you do it on a high knee elliptical Then you Mm. get like an hour of Twittering in and you feel super productive because you also worked out. You also taught me how effective lists can be. Oh, those are my favorite. That's that's a conversation for another day, though. Lists are great. Yeah, we should talk lists. Also, dear listeners, if you follow us on Twitter at Upside FM, which you should, you can see that we have published a few public lists that are, I would say, very high value. So check those out. We have accelerators, VCs, community builders, founders and companies our pod guests, very, very good list for you to be tied into. We follow them, we interact with people there, and so can you. Speaking of our live tweeting at our South by Southwest panel, Eric, today we are airing a special episode, which is a recording of that panel at South by Southwest. That's right. So you can check out the transcript, you can check out the audio right here, or you can check out some of the quotables. That's what I'll call them. I'll call them the quotables on our live tweet, which we will link to on the tweet announcing this episode. Bear with us on the audio. We were working with what we could. There was some feedback at times. We think the file came out pretty well. Listen all the way through. We even included the guest question and answer at the end of the panel. Our guests, which we do introduce on the recording, are Andy Sparks, founder and CEO of Holloway in San Francisco, Rachel Carpenter of Entrinio, who is episode 24 founder from St. Petersburg, and Brandon Bryant, the partner and co-founder of Harlem Capital in New York City, moderated by yours truly. And once again, thank you guys for all of your support in voting for that panel this year. We would not have had the panel, most likely, if not for that support. So we very much appreciate it. We hope that you enjoy the products of that panel, which you can listen to right here. You had to throw the most likely in there, huh? Most likely. Yes. You couldn't just give the listeners full credit. You had to say 
<laughs> Most likely. Look, even Hank disagrees with you. Do you hear him in the background? <laughs> Sorry. If you guys want to yell at me for that, you can tweet at us at Upside FM or at J Klaus. If you have thoughts on the episode, please tweet at Upside FM and use the hashtag Finding Upside, which is what we're using at the event. You can follow the event as it happened using that hashtag Finding Upside. And now for some validation. Eric, what do you think is the number one piece of positive feedback we get from listeners about the show? Eric looks so good. Strange piece of feedback to get on something that's based on audio. Well, you know, they can, they can intuit. Yeah, they can intuit. They can intuit the look. I do get some compliments on your voice, your podcast voice. Well, it just took five filters, a pop filter, a audio engineer that we pay every episode, and a new mic, and boom, nailed it. Yeah, it's like the airbrushing of podcasts. But no, I think the number one piece of feedback that we get is that we come across as authentic. We don't come across as is... authentic. We are authentic, Jay. That's what being authentic is. <laughs> and that is the title of this review on iTunes from Ben Snelling. He says, Jay and Eric are crushing it. It's an inspiration to hear insights into some of the fastest growing companies in the Midwest. And I love Jay and Eric's take on business valuations and angel investor techniques. They are real and authentic. Keep up the great work, guys, and fight the good fight. That's true. We are real and we're authentic, I think. We are authentically real and we're doing our best. So if you guys are enjoying the show as well, please leave a review on iTunes for a chance of us reading it here on the pod. And we'll do it real and we'll do it authentically. Thank you so much for joining us here. I know you guys have a lot of choices, probably an overwhelming number of choices to go to with this hour of your day. So thank you so much for being here. We're here to talk about geography and how it relates to investing. We hope you guys get a lot out of it. Just to get a feel for the room, how many people here are founders or entrepreneurs? Awesome. Any investors in the room? Awesome. Cool. Cool. We'll touch on both sides of that, obviously. So our goal today is to talk about the role geography plays in receiving investment, talk about the role that it should play in receiving an investment, and talk about how investors can find companies with upside regardless of geography. This is a topic that I've become interested in recently. I'm going to be our moderator today. I've become interested in this topic recently because of a podcast I've been running for the last eight months or so called Upside, where we talk to startup companies in communities outside of Silicon Valley. And we talk to them about their everything about their company, how they're fundraising, how they're building the company, what the role of their geography plays for them. And so it's gotten myself and my co-host Eric, who's taking a photo of the screen right now. Thank you, Eric. We've, we've learned a lot about different geographies, and so it's, it's a topic that's just interesting to us to explore. I'm joined by Rachel Carpenter, the CEO and founder of Intrinio. Intrinio is a disruptive financial data platform launched in 2015. Based in the company's Florida office, Rachel has overall responsibility for Intrinio, including driving its strategy and position for long-term growth. She's an advanced front-end web developer and a graduate of the Starter League Advanced Web Design course. Rachel graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a BBA in both finance and management and minors in Spanish and European studies. She's a member of the Forbes Finance Council, a member of the Data Coalition advocating for open structured data, and a board member at CASA, the largest domestic violence shelter in Florida. We want to make this panel social, guys, so feel free to tweet with the hashtag FindingUpside. I have the panelists' handles up here on each of these slides, and it'll be in the slide where we have our discussion as well. Next to Rachel is Brandon Bryant. Brandon Bryant received his degree in economics from Ohio State University and worked at Bank of America Merrill Lynch as an investment banker for three years. Afterwards, he transitioned to the marketing world as a social media content creator, his handle is Wall Street Paper, working with companies like Uber, Microsoft, Walmart, Wall Street Journal, and GQ, if you've heard of any of those. He also co-founded Harlem Capital, an early stage venture capital fund that is focused on investing, companies, investing in companies founded by people of color and women. And then to his left is Andy Sparks. Andy Sparks is the co-founder and CEO of Holloway, a new digital publishing company focused on publishing the best knowledge on navigating the challenges of modern work for all to find. Holloway is backed by NEA and the New York Times. Previously, he co-founded Mattermark, a provider of data on private companies that raised more than $17 million and sold for far less than that. Andy graduated... <laughs> pause. <laughs> 
Andy graduated from the Ohio State University, lives in San Francisco, and will be publishing a book on how to raise venture capital later this summer. So can you please join me in giving a hand to our panelists here today? Rachel, I'm going to start with you. You're based in St. Petersburg, Florida. Yes. So what advantages do you see as a financial data company to being in St. Petersburg, Florida? Aside of the fact that we have 360 days of sunshine during the year, which is certainly a plus. So we actually ended up down in St. Petersburg randomly when we were getting our company started because we had a lot of technology to build, and we were originally in Chicago, which is a very high cost of living when you're making no money and don't want to raise a ton of money from investors early on. So we ended up down there. We were honestly just looking for a cheap place to program for two years to get all of our tech built. So we ended up down in Florida. And two things, I guess, kind of happened once we got there. The first was that we absolutely loved it. It was kind of like a well-kept secret that we had great, you know, lifestyle down there, bars, restaurants, things to do, easy flight straight up to New York when you need it. And we just absolutely loved the area. We found it easy to recruit talent down there. People wanted to come, you know, program with us on the beach as well. But also we started to think of it as less of a disadvantage and more of a competitive advantage considering the cost basis down there. So, you know, just generally speaking, our operating costs are ridiculously low relative to any of our competitors that are trying to get started on the, on the coast. So that's kind of the thesis behind it. In your industry is predominantly in New York, right? We sell data on like over a million securities globally, and so we have customers all over the world, but a lot of the major hedge funds and asset managers and banks that we sell to are on the East Coast, yeah. And so being in Florida, most of your investors to this point are outside of Florida, correct? Yes. And so where are they based? Yeah, I beat my head against the wall for about a year trying to raise money in Florida. And I would say that the first half of my fundraising efforts as I was getting the company off the ground, people thought of it as a disadvantage and it was a big struggle. It was a struggle with Florida investors because all Florida investors understand is real estate and restaurants and they're very risk averse and there's a lot of education that needs to happen in that area. So that was one problem. And early on when I went outside of Florida and tried to talk to investors in San Francisco and New York, this was you know almost five years ago, it was a bad thing. Now considering obviously the rise of the rest movement, it's not really a bad thing anymore. And there was a notable shift kind of almost like a year or two ago, when I stopped getting asked the question, why aren't you in New York? And people started to recognize that, you know, if you're in an industry that's working on being disruptive, you're up against a lot of big companies that have high costs, and a huge competitive advantage can be having lower costs, and being in a unique place that has a great lifestyle to attract talent. So, yeah, I have investors out of Singapore, New York, and and, uh, the California area now. Andy, you're in San Francisco, and you started Holloway in San Francisco. Can you talk about the advantages that you see yourself having for being in that hotbed? Yeah, definitely. The first one that I'd say is just the access to talent in addition to the capital. Raising money is obviously, it's, I think, it makes it a little bit easier just because the density of how many people are in San Francisco. I also raised some of the money from this round in New York. I spend a week out of every quarter in New York. But when I say density of talent, what I really mean is like when you don't know how to do something in your company, which is basically every six months you have to reinvent yourself or figure out how to do something new, there's this network of people who have done it before and they've been successful and they're three blocks away for a cup of coffee and it's really hard to beat that. So whether it's you're trying to figure out marketing or you're trying to figure out a new channel for sales or you're trying to figure out how to hire people out of big tech companies, there's people that have just done that and, they're, and, they're, and you're surrounded by them. Uh, and it's hard, to, it's hard to beat just how many, the sheer number of people are, are a couple blocks away from you. I think that one thing that I tell people a lot that aren't in San Francisco is come spend a couple weeks here every year or come sp- spend a week here every quarter and you can get a lot of that benefit. The network is pretty open. People are really willing to introduce you to other people. You don't necessarily have to live there, but there is an investment in the network that I think is worth it for almost every entrepreneur to just come and spend some time there and get to know people. What's it been like for you? Rachel talked about costs and the costs of living and and building a business being lower in Florida. Access to capital is easier for you in San Francisco, but your costs are higher too, I would assume. So talk to me about what that experience is like for you building a company with just a naturally higher burn rate. Yeah, if your analysis of San Francisco is that it's purely a cost trade-off of this place costs this much and this place costs this much, I think that you're not valuing it right. I think that San Francisco, especially if you don't have an existing network, is a place you need to think about as an investment for a few years of your life, that you go there, you get to know people, and then you can always leave. I personally have 
a love-hate relationship with San Francisco. It's crazy expensive. It has one of the most asinine local governments in the entire United States. It's not going to get cheaper. It's probably only going to get more expensive. They need to build more housing, but the one thing that San Francisco refuses to do is build more housing. So, so it's not going to get any more affordable in San Francisco. And almost everyone that I know that's been there for five, six, seven, eight years is on their way out. They're trying to figure out how to move to Denver, how to move to Seattle, how to move to New York. At some point, you just hit a, you get to San Francisco and you kind of have gotten into the network. You know a lot of people. You can get a meeting with people that you need to. And then you say, I'm kind of sick of spending. I think the median rent, or the average rent that they reported two weeks ago was like $3,500 for a single bedroom. And so almost everyone that I know, as soon as they you know, start to have a family, start to think about having kids, they're either moving out of the city to Oakland or Berkeley or somewhere else, which are now getting just as expensive and also refusing to build new housing. Uh, so they're deciding to leave and move to another city, which also, just from a personal standpoint, isn't super fun when all your friends leave every four years. <laughs> and you've raised outside of San Francisco, too. Yeah, uh, and so- absolutely. How did, you, how did you find those investors and why did you find those investors? So actually the New York Times found us. So we, the day that we announced that we existed, Jake from the New York Times just sent us an email and said, hey, we've been waiting for something like this for a long time. That's cool. And I said, oh, well, I'm going to be in New York next week. And I don't think I was going to be in New York next week, but I got on a plane and I was in New York the next week. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that I, we have a few investors in New York City, and I think that New York City, especially for a company that's in publishing and media, you need to go where the experts in your industry are. So for the early part of my career, I wanted to learn how to build a software company, and so I moved to San Francisco, and I learned how to do that. And right now, I'm trying to learn how to build a publishing and media company, and so I'm spending a lot of time in Boston or New York City or places where those industries are. Brandon, you are the investor in New York. So talk to us about what you look for in investments and what type of role where the company is based plays in that. So I'll even step back and talk a little bit just about Harlem Capital as well. Like, so Harlem Capital started in one of my business partners' living room. And we just wanted to, we're four ex-bankers, we just wanted to invest in real estate or invest in small business. And we started investing in startups and we saw a problem when in, in the startup round where it was like, we don't see anyone who looks like us and we want to dig deeper on this problem. And so people of color and women, we started looking and say, okay, 130 plus billion went to venture last year, but roughly 2% of that or 3% of that went to people of color and women. Maybe we can dig in deeper on this. And that's how it all started. And those are the type of founders we look for, folks who are digging on problems, solving something for themselves, if you, if you will, um, talking in, in terms of just like our overall and like investing criteria or what have you. Folks who have some type of traction already, product market fit, roughly 100,000 to maybe 500 in revenue. They have a full-time team, have a, you know, a clear pathway of how they're going to grow their business. Also, we look for like founder self-awareness. We look for passion. We look for vision. We look for just like a lot of things that you want to invest into the, the, the actual team, the actual jockey, not necessarily the horse. We also look at the investor landscape. Can you attract other investors to want to invest with you? Because we're not writing the check for the entire round. We want to work with other folks. We want to diversify our risk. And we want to, we want to share notes with other individuals as well. And then going into geography and stuff like that, people of color and women tend to be outside of Silicon Valley. So we're industry agnostic. A lot of our investments have already been outside of Silicon Valley. Um, we've invested in like Baltimore. We've invested in Chicago. We've invested in LA. We've invested in Atlanta. Atlanta, we've invested in Columbus. We know Columbus very well. And we see that those folks, one, have companies that have been around longer. They have more revenue. They're going through a lot of challenges that a lot of founders in Silicon Valley may not have, have went through. And it's, it's kind of refreshing to see folks like yourself you know, pulling themselves out by their bootstraps and executing at a high level. And finally, again, that chance to have the opportunity to have expertise from investors, but also have that capital to scale their business. So structurally, you guys are already building Harlem to be able to invest outside of New York. How does that process logistically work, and how can a founder get into your pipeline if they're not in New York? Yeah, man. I mean, so we actually look back at how we get all of our deal flow. We see about like probably like five to seven hundred deals a year. About forty percent of those are inbound. Twenty-five percent of those or so are from LinkedIn. So sitting in a deal and like hitting someone up in LinkedIn is actually like extremely professional and, and the right thing to do. Um, also being at places like this, like a, a South by Our Basel, Coachella, uh, All Star Weekend for NBA, Super Bowl, other big conferences, like all the top players, in my opinion, investors are at all those places because either they're LPs to their fund or a company they invested in is sponsoring something there. 
And it's just like a good opportunity to get in front of them without it being so like corporate or being so professional. It's like, hey, like, oh, you're from X, Y, and Z. I actually have a startup company. Here's my card. We'll love to send you our investment deck. We're actually looking to raise. Like, it's very, I think it's very simple to do it that way. And then understand like warm intros are really good. I, obviously, they're not the only thing that, that needs to be done, but a warm intro always gets you a little bit farther than a cold email. And then also to potentially talking to another founder that maybe we've invested in and having them intro us or talking to a potentially like another investor who's just in this space that may, that may know us. So we get a lot of deal flow from other investors. And then here's a marquee thing that we think we're, our DNA is in content and media. So we believe that people of color and women are like experts in that space and that's where they spend a lot of time at. So that's what we're spending a lot of time at as well. And if you look at folks like First Round Capital, like they're probably one of the best VCs in content and they get into a lot of the top companies and they start building out these processes for their, their companies and their founders end up being like individuals who just like scream at the top of the mountains about how they're so great. So that's how we're, we're trying to like build our firm as well. And we, we understand, you know, we're fundraising a $25 million fund, not the, the biggest fund, but if we could continually build that strong brand, our, our goal is to basically, if any person of color or woman starts a company, we can be one of the first two calls. And then that shows us that we're doing our job right. A lot of founders are just naturally outsiders in some way or another. So if they can't get that warm intro, mm. what do you see as the best way to get in front of you? Man, that's a good question. If they can't get that warm intro, go through the content. So go through the Medium post and make the comment. Go through the, one of our YouTube channels. Go through the Instagram DM. And also do the email still. And just follow up through all of those. We're going to see it. I mean, if you come correctly, so there, here's the other thing. A lot of investors have their criteria on their website. We do. Hey, send us a deck. Send us these four or five things. Like, when are you, how much are you fundraising? When are you closing? Who's in the round? What's your revenue AR, ARR, X, Y, and Z? And that helps us, like, sift through everything really quickly. So I, I would go through social media channels because, unfortunately, a lot of us are actually on social media more than we're on our email. <laughs> and, you know, you just have to... You have to play that same game. But to follow up, like consistency, that's been like a, something that we've been talking about. Consistency is, is the best. I follow up to mentors and people who I want to invest in their company. I'll follow up seven times. It's, it's really, I just copy and paste the same thing. <laughs> so it's really not that, that hard. And understand if you don't get in touch with that person, there's more than one investor. Another thing I want to say, investors invest in about one, maybe 2% of the companies that they see. So understanding that as a founder is like, hey, like maybe this investor doesn't invest this round, maybe they can invest next round. So if you raise 1.5 million in your seed, going into your A, potentially right after your seed, you can just say, hey, we rose our seed already, but still want to keep you on the radar for our A. So that follow-up game, that consistency, continuing to pound the pavement is, is probably the best thing they can do. I want to ask this to Rachel and Andy. What have you guys found as your best way to start building relationships with investors that you didn't previously have? I think starting the conversation with investors that are not in your wheelhouse early is really important. That's actually how I got investors in my Series A round. We look a lot bigger than we are online. So I was like, I was like getting calls from General Atlantic when I should not have been getting calls from General Atlantic. But I took the calls because there are a lot of friends of General Atlantic that are earlier stage companies. And if they like you and you're obviously passionate and they think that your idea is good, it just doesn't fit their mandate or you're too small or too early stage for them. And they will make intros. It's a, it's a tight knit community. It's a small community. And that is probably one of the best ways that I've found a lot of my existing investors. You know, just getting on the phone with those guys, you know, following up with them every couple of months, they get you on the gamut and they call you every six months to keep up with you. And then they're willing to make introductions as well. But also with respect to geography, like I think it's only a barrier if you make Make it one. That's just not the way the world operates anymore. Like I have angel, angel investors out of Singapore who are like pretty serious financial services executives who found me, and I didn't have to go to Singapore to get them to invest in my company. It's just those. I think those are just barriers if you if you create them and you think of them that way. So, yeah, I just don't. I don't think it's as much as an, of an issue as people make it, but definitely putting in the work early on, like it can feel like you're wasting time when you're taking those phone calls with, with the later stage guys, but that in particular is one strategy that ended up in, inking us some pretty great VCs. I have so many thoughts on this. <laughs> I have so many thoughts. The first one, my, one of my favorite phrases for this, which both of you have touched on, Mark Suster from uh, Upfront, he has this phrase called, in investors invest in lines, not dots. Mm -hmm. So the first time that an investor meets someone, you're a dot on a chart. And he's looking for 
lines that go up and to the right. Even if you go up and to the right and you fall off a cliff for a while, but then you're going back up to the right because you're learning or you're starting a new company. That's what they look for. So investors are fundamentally collectors of people and people who have talent who they think they could build a really great business one day. And it's pretty common for me to meet an investor who says, you know what, I'm not sure about the thing they're working on right now, but I'm pretty sure they're going to build a really great company at some point. Mm -hmm. And so they're building that relationship and they're trying to stay close to that person. So when they do come to them with something that they think is interesting, they might invest. Another thing I would say is, like I went to school in Ohio, my parents went to the University of Iowa. I had no network. <laughs> uh, like I... I got my boss from Ohio sent me to South by Southwest one year as like a consolation prize for winning a deal. And I ended up meeting one person here. We had beer until like 2 a.m. at the Hilton Hotel talking about science fiction books. And that person ended up being my only contact in San Francisco when I moved out there. And we ended up starting my last company together. And so I think that one thing is like building a network and breaking into the network doesn't just happen immediately. Oftentimes there's a really cheap criticism of millennials that we want stuff to happen really fast and we're not patient. And I think it's definitely true. I think it's just a human thing. It's not just a millennial thing. But it can take 10 years to build a career and build a network and a space and you've got to really be willing to put in the work and you know, you're not going to get a meeting with Mark Andreessen maybe as your first meeting when you're trying to you know, get into Silicon Valley. You might come talk to one of us. <laughs> like in, and we know some people and maybe you know, if we think you're a nice person and you're not a jerk and maybe you're hard working and you're a lifelong learner, maybe we introduce you to some people. Um, I would add to that too, just build a good product and focus on yeah. that. It helps quite a bit. One of our early angels, when we were struggling and pretending like we weren't struggling, came to us because he was CEO of a large fintech platform that needed data and we sell data. And so he was looking for a data partner to integrate. And once he did a trial of our API and pulled the data into his platform, he recognized, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to be a client. And also, I'd like to personally invest. And once he got through that barrier, he said, let me introduce you to all the investors in my fintech platform as well. And it just instantly opened up this whole network. But it was because we built a great platform that was useful and valuable to him. And then we got in the door that way. And it just opened up the doors. Yeah. But it was all because we were just narrowly focused on building a great platform and a product, which helps. I asked the same question on a panel in San Francisco that I was moderating, and it was uh, Satya Patel from Homebrew Ventures, and his answer was, just build a great f company. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how many times have the two of you been told no? I, Way more times than I I don't even know how to count. Yeah, like right. I, I, I'm just finishing up Series A fundraising right now, and I <clears throat> probably talked to over 100 investors, and 95 plus percent of them said no. So how do you manage just like hearing that and staying the course and saying like, okay, I'm going to keep building these relationships anyway. Like what was the moment where you learned that you had to do that? And then practically like, what's your mindset? How do you get through that? Well, Florida helped a lot because that was pretty much 100% no's because nobody in Florida understands backend financial services infrastructure. But I think part of the lesson for me in this too is also recognizing that like I can say no too. And so recognizing that this is a, like a marriage with an investor. I think once I realized that, I was able to take the nose a lot easier and also give my own nose to, to VCs and, and investors that weren't the right fit for me. I'd say every no is a learning experience for you. To, and, and the hard thing about the learning experience is you have to figure out, is this a no because there's something that sucks about my business and the, the way that I pitched it? Or is this a no because this investor just doesn't get it? <laughs> Reed Hoffman who started LinkedIn and Greylock has a really great theory all around secrets. So basically like what is your secret and you want to spend time with people who understand your secrets. Like I know that it was Tristan Walker from Bevel was like going out there telling everyone that you know he's building this new shaving company and there's all these white guys who are just like, I don't get it. Is, how, why is this a problem? I don't believe this is a problem. And he's like, I'm just wasting my time because these people don't get the fact that this is my secret. And Reid Hoffman uses that as a story in Masters of Scale, which is just like over and over again, you go in and you have to figure out, is this person telling me no because they just don't get it? Or are they telling me no because I need to figure out something in my pitch? And oftentimes it's a little bit of both. And I think that you just have to be enormously self-reflective. You also have to take feedback. You can't be defensive when someone tells you no. You have to figure out you know, how you can use that to build a relationship. Oftentimes I've been told no from one investor and then it's been four years later and I'm sitting with the same investor and they're investing in another company of mine. So again, like invest in, like, in lines, not dots. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in here um, from the investor perspective. Like, 
Venture capital funds are also startups, so just like letting you guys understand that part too. Like we have LPs, we have to return capital to other folks who give us money. So we're going through the, the same thing. Uh, not not every single VC person who's at a VC is in the fundraising chair, but at least at Harlem Capital, all four of us are in the fundraising chair. So we see venture is just like a contact sport, right? It's contact and awareness. Can you stay in contact with people? Can they be aware of what you got going on? So quarterly updates are great. There's so many companies that we didn't have the chance to invest in who still have us on their quarterly updates. And sometimes that makes us really want to jump at the opportunity to invest in their next round. Also like social validation. So other investors, when we look at your brand online, social media, what have you, it looks clean. It looks like I would want to be a consumer of that, of that brand. I'm also going to all these conferences. Like, There's so many people we've had the opportunity to almost invest in or some LPs want to invest in us from speaking on panels all over the country. So being like your own best champion out here, putting your feet on the ground, it's pretty good. And then lastly, on the geographical side, if you feel that that is like a disadvantage for you, go do an accelerator or potentially an incubator in a big city. The company we invested in out of, out of Columbus, she was at Techstars in New York. She happened to be the best person at Techstars in that cohort, and we didn't care where she lived. So if you are in a small market and you go to one of these bigger markets and you just show up and show out and you're the top, then you will get that opportunity to get investment. Building a company is this journey of over and over again having to solve new problems. And so getting told no by an investor is just one of the problems that you have to figure out. It's this enormously mental game that you're going to be playing for decades where time and time again, something's not working. Either the pitch that you're giving to an investor or a sales meeting or something that you've built or no one's using your product, and you're going to continuously basically be told that you're doing something wrong. It's a continuous feedback loop where you kind of suck. And you have to get over that and get over that and get over that. And guess what? Around the corner, there's something else that you're doing wrong and you're going to have to fix that. And so getting attuned to what are these things that are in, you're facing and how can you solve those problems systematically, that's just kind of like welcome to the beginning of the game. This is level one. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, you talked about an early stage or a, a new VC firm also kind of being a startup. Yeah. Through our podcast, we've learned just through you know a few dozen reps, well, we had no idea what we were thinking when we're, ta- we're starting to so do we. companies. <laughs> exactly. So tell me now, now a couple years into this, how has your evaluation and what you look for in companies changed? Oh, man. I mean, it's, I think it changes per industry almost. Like for Harlem Capital, like we didn't know, we, were, we are industry agnostic, but we're not investing in like capital intensive companies or something that's, you need a PhD to get up to speed. So like blockchain or VR, what have you. So we're thinking about 60%, 60%, 70% is going to be enterprise, and then the rest of the fund would probably be consumer. And so we're just trying to put our heads down there, build the right consultants to help us get up to speed. So we've invested in a mental product company. We just invested in a logistics company. We're looking at a telehealth, and then now we're also looking at something like a Procter & Gamble. So we've been really relying on our industry experts to get up to speed. And that's something for founders. like. Build an awesome team. You are like the Tony Stark or the Captain Marvel of your team. You need to build other Avengers to join it so that they can know what you don't know or like help you ex- execute at a high level. And then just talking more about like how, that, how our investment theology has evolved over time. I think it's just reps. Like you can't really know what you don't know. You can't see what you haven't seen before. And he was just talking about it like you every no or every opportunity to even look at a company like gets you up to speed for the next time you see it and sometimes you may just be like hey that was a mistake that we didn't invest but we want to stay in touch with them because if they exit a company or maybe we can follow on but if they exit company we want to be the first investor for their next one and i I was just reading or just listening to uh, 20 vc and uh, i believe it's josh copeman from first round was talking about he missed Twitter because it was, it was a first deal that was too expensive for him. And Twitter, Jack came back. Hey, do you, I know we got all these other investors in. I just really wanted to know if you wanted to be in again. Still said no. So then Jack came back for Square, even higher price. Josh learned. And he invested on the spot into that next one. So I think it's just like scar tissue. Um, one of my good mentors, Nahal from ENIAC, 
he talked about having so much scar tissue from like going through building companies or going through LP meetings and stuff like that. So I think for us, we just want to build up as much scar tissue as possible, fail, 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 fall forward, so that we can continue to be flexible and adjust our theology. And at the end of the day, if you are a kick-ass founder and are very smart and understand your product, we just believe that you will figure it out. So we're rather invest in that than actually, oh, is it built out? Where's the revenue? Where's this? Where's this? If you can really close, show that you have a, a, a strong grip on everything, then that's an opportunity for someone to just bet on you, which is kind of what you want, because you'll pivot to business and you'll change different things along the course anyways. What if someone has a strong grip on something, but they're, out, they're in one of those outlier industries that you didn't want to touch initially? Man, th- I think... So for the the telehealth company that we had, they have two extremely large players in like digital health who are leading their round and we're we're just in the syndication. So that makes us feel comfortable. We use our industry experts to make us feel comfortable. But it's if it's too complex, then it's just it's unfortunately just not for us. And if you are in a complex area, you want strategic investors anyways. So some, we invested in a company in our angel portfolio, which was all our own money that was in the retail space. And we understood that this company is technically not a venture capital company. They need someone who is at like Tommy Hilfiger or they need someone at, we got them a, an investor that was in the retail space and they don't have to grow as fast anymore, but they can get help with um, unique economics. They get help with operations and stuff like that. So understand if you, you don't have to do the typical VC, you could do just like a strategic person who has good bankroll and they have good relationships in that industry and that can still help you get to, I mean, you want to get to an exit, right? Like you want to get to exit somehow, some way. I mean, you want to impact people along the way and run a good company. But if the end goal is exit, it doesn't have to be a typical VC. It could be someone who's strategic. And most companies should not raise venture capital. I think this is something that's just massively misunderstood. So venture capital is a, has, is a very specific business model, right? They have a very specific set of skills. Yes. <laughs> and venture capital, in order to substantiate their business model, they need to have companies that are worth several billion dollars, not just a billion. Like a, a $1 billion company is actually, you need many of those in a venture capital portfolio and actually to make the returns that they tell their LPs that they're, that they're going to actually get for them, that their LPs expect. Um, and so when a venture capitalist is looking at your company, they're saying, could this be one of the biggest companies in the world? And there are a lot of really good companies that do 10 to 100 million in EBITDA, a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. There's great companies that do that, and you do not need venture capital to do that. And when you take money from venture capital, you make commitments that you're going to be a huge company. There are some sort of like edge case strategies that you can take where if you take a you know, a smallish check from a fund fund with a ton of assets under management. You know, if you take two million from a fund with a billion under management, then you're one of the small fish in their portfolio, so you're probably not going to get a ton of pressure. But ultimately you need to really take in into account what the business model of venture capital it is. And I don't know what someone I don't know if it was Recode, Kara Swisher or something said that uh, no, it was it was the guys from Basecamp, that venture capital kills more companies than it actually builds. Because oftentimes venture capitalists invest in a company and you know it's doing $10 million in revenue and they're growing 50% year over year. But for VCs, that's not enough. You need to be growing 100% year over year, 200% year over year. You need to be getting towards a billion dollar company. And you have an entrepreneur sitting there like, dude, my company's doing $10 million in revenue. This is terrific. We're profitable. And the VC says, no, we got to pour more money on the fire. They feed the founder's ego. And then everything goes up in flames. So really take that into consideration when you're building your business, whether you should be, build, you should be raising venture capital at all. Andy or Rachel, have you guys ever taken dumb money, like unstrategic capital? Or dumb strategic money? No, <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Yeah, I mean, I think the farther along that we've gone, the more strategic our investors have become. And I think early on, angel investing can be, angel investing really should be strategic, and I don't think it is. That's part of the problem we actually have down in Florida with angel groups that are unionizing early stage capital. But you know, early on, we took some money from angels just to keep, keep the fire burning and keep building. Most of our angels were very strategic, though. The, we, the weirdly unique thing about Florida is that a lot of Wall Street executives retire down there, which was amazing for us and very surprising. And you probably wouldn't think that, Um, but there's a huge financial services landscape down there. So there were some investors that didn't know anything about finance and like definitely not financial data, but for the most part, our angels were coming from the Wall Street space. And then as we got further to more institutional capital, it became very strategic and I wouldn't call any of that really dumb money. Any of the unstrategic money, was it not worth it or was it all worth it? 
I mean, I guess I would say keeping a small cap table is very important. So there, there are times when that can be a very negative thing for you. I don't think we got to that point, but that is something to be aware of, that if you take a lot of money from a lot of small investors, it makes it really hard to raise capital later on. The thing I was going to say about dumb money, I think there's another way to talk about, have you taken money from somebody who pitched you something and they didn't follow through on those? I mean, as a venture capitalist, like contacts, 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 introductions, introduction, introductions, and all across, it's like what we should be bringing to the table. If, if not, you know, if we're strategic, we, should, we can bring some expertise, we can help you hire talent, we can help you, we can jump in on a sprint on a new product or getting something to market. Like, that's what we should be bringing to the table. But even from like the VC side, some, some LPs just write a check and run. And you just, and they just say, put my face in the deck and cool. So sometimes that hurts, but it's like, I think it's up to you as the founder of the team to, to market that for whatever you need to market that for, to get in certain doors or to potentially get that real strategic money that you actually need. There's the underreaching, which is, <laughs> is dumb, but there's also the overreaching side of that, which is also dumb money too, which is like, you need to be building your business. And sometimes there can be early stage investors that just want to be like part of it with you and are constantly calling. And so I'd say the underreach and the overreaching investor both can be can be bad, bad money. I think part of the dialogue around investor selection is oftentimes a very like privileged conversation because a lot of entrepreneurs, you're starting a business and you've got like one person who can give you a check and you're like, well, who knows if they're good or not, but I need the 50K because I'm going to be able to pay somebody tomorrow to build this thing. And you take the money and you figure it out. And then you have all this bias later on after you built a company and you talk about all the smart money that you raised from. But there's that one person that gave you 20K up front and, you know, maybe they were a, a thorn in your side, but you needed the money and that helped you get your business started. And so to some degree, you're like, that's, that's, all, that's the only option you have. So I think that in that case, like, take the money, you go build the business and you move on and you learn from it. And you, you know that it's a risk to that person. You, know, you tell them, I think if you do take money from an unsophisticated or someone who's not a traditional startup or business investor, is to look them in the eye and say, hey, are you okay with me never giving you this money back? Because if you give me this check, the most likely scenario is you never see this money again, let alone a return. And if you're okay with that, cool, I'll take your money. But like, you should just expect that we're going to try this and we're going to do our best, but you're probably not going to get the money back. And if they're okay with that, then I think that you've at least safeguarded the relationship in the, in the most likely scenario, which the most likely scenario is that you fail. Think about, the, think about the legal side of your cap table and like what, what rights you're giving up when you are letting folks invest in your business. A few of the companies we've invested in had pretty messy cap tables. Some of them didn't even have boards and could potentially, if they fundraise the, keep fundraising the same way they were going to raise, they could get pushed out of the company and have nothing to say for it. And so that's like a really big thing. Like founders really need to, to protect themselves and their teams on the legal side. And if find out some way to have someone look at your docs because that stuff really gets tricky once you start getting big players in because they may not invest in you just because of the legal ramifications of like we don't have enough opportunity to invest and actually get rights to the returns as early as we usually want to and that's like a turn off for us and we can't invest. I have one more question and then I'd love to take some questions from the audience. So if you guys have questions you can just line up there behind that mic and we'll kind of go one at a time here for the panel. But, Can I follow up real fast on that? Sure. So <clears throat> this will be slightly a shameless plug, but I promise it'll be useful to everyone in the audience. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that you said was get good counsel, get good legal representation, get good legal advice. Now, the only problem with good legal advice on startups is it usually costs $950 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're trying to figure out, you know, I, I don't have money. I haven't raised anything yet, but I need good legal advice. and I, have, I can't afford it. So what the hell do you do? So one of the things I've been spending the last year and a half doing is writing a book on raising venture capital, and we really clearly outline every one of the legal terms. Happy to give everyone else here early access to it, but it's something that if you can't afford the legal opinion, you can at least read a little bit about the terms and what you're getting yourself into. And at a bare minimum, everyone in the audience should read Venture Deals by Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson. So um, thank you. Actually, let's take your question. Let's take it right now. Does anybody have experience with international expansion? And location decisions regarding that? Not yet. <laughs> I think this is, I, I think I'm useless on this. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have, was there a specific question? No, I'm More just specific. curious, I'm, I'm in that business. Okay. And um, so I was wondering whether or not you had any, you know, insights from your side. In, insights in terms of raising capital 
outside of the no, United in terms States? Of, in terms of location, criteria, location decisions, you know, would you go somewhere that's less expensive? Would you go somewhere that's more expensive for a certain benefit that comes with that region or, or place? What would be your decision-making criteria? Specifically internationally? Yeah, I mean, it would have to be lower cost than where we're at, which is hard to do, so that would definitely be a big factor for us. That's part of our, you know, that's part of our competitive advantage and part of our business model is to be very low cost operationally. So that would be a huge factor, at least for my business. Definitely lower cost or like um, standard of living, access to really good talent. So like by a university or something like that. And then like a short flight from potential like LPs or clients. Okay. Thank, Thank you for your you. question. But I would say hopefully somebody in the room has that information yeah. and can talk to the gentleman later. Hey, guys. I'm Tessa, also from Columbus, Ohio. Shout Woo. out. Yay. <laughs> My question is for Brandon specifically, but feel free anyone else to jump in. So I know that you mentioned about fundraising, but as a venture capitalist, I'd love to know more on where you actually source your funds that you give. Got you, got you. And another thing we're talking about how to get in contact with a venture capitalist or an investor, go to a conference and ask a question because someone will introduce you. So that's really cool. How do we have access to our funds? So we all had backgrounds in finance. So we actually had all of our old bosses invest first. So we all worked on Wall Street for a few years. So we had old bosses. And then you go back and think about who's any influential, high net worth individual you've ever met in your life. Then you go to them. And then after all of them, after all those folks say no to you, you ask them, who do they know? And then those folks say no. And then you're at the third degree and folks potentially start to introduce you to that family and friends. And after you get some traction, then you start talking to bigger players. So he was talking about your first pitch shouldn't be to Andreessen and Horowitz. It should be to another entrepreneur. It should be to a small angel investor. Then you finally get up to the, to the realm of a venture capitalist. So we took that same thought process and we just like market mapped everything out. And then eventually after you get some traction and we started building a lot of content, a lot of brand around it. So we had Forbes 30 under 30. We were Ebony Power 100. We were all these cool things and we use those as like hooks for people to reach out to us and then we're we're traveling everywhere we're at every single conference we're at every single big event and i'm from my side all the top entrepreneurs all the top investors also go to all of those events and they host things and so as we started shaking more hands and said harlem and harlem capital is a great name i you know thank god for letting us get it people just recognize harlem capital instantaneously i wear my Harlem Capital shirt most days. And eventually you just have to come in and show up. And the last part is like your marketing materials. We design our marketing materials as if we were a startup. So there's a company actually out of Australia called deckworks.co and they will do your deck for you for probably a thousand bucks. And it looks amazing. And so people come and look at our deck and say, hey, this is not finance guys doing it. This is like a startup. This is actually like a product. This is actually a vehicle. Um, and then lastly, the mission. There's a lot of folks who are focused on closing that gap. So, you know, there's 75% of America is diverse, but only 3% of that 130 plus billion goes to those folks. So there's a lot of people who are working on closing those gaps. So if you can get in touch with those people and go to those conferences and talk on those panels, we talked on my business partner talked on the uh, Bumble panel and after that we had four people or we had four opportunities to talk to LPs and like I'm talking big time institutions household names like tech conglomerates and it's just from just being out there contact sport you got to talk 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 shake a hand kiss baby do something there's a lot of buzz around kind of corporate venture capital at the moment and I think some of those models are clearly not not very effective um, but so I was just wondering from you guys what if any role you could see that corporates or the enterprise have in, in the venture ecosystem I think that's definitely a growing trend but I think there's too many horror stories floating around for it to pick up. I, I think it's going to. I think one of the biggest challenges is, is on one hand, the copying issue, the risk, and all the horror stories, which scares a lot of the entrepreneurs away. And then on the other side of the table, there's, there aren't very many good frameworks for early stage venture investing inside of corporations. And there are actually some models that are popping up where it's like outsourced you know, deal sourcing and diligence models that are starting to pop up, which is actually really interesting. That could solve one of the biggest problems. But there really is no framework for 
going through diligence in an early stage deal inside of a corporation. It's more usually like a corp dev process, which is traditionally focused towards M&A, which is not the right way to evaluate an early stage business. I mean, there's also the argument that that's just not the right move for a corporation because it doesn't fit into their business model. But I think there's a lot of pressure just to innovate in general. We went through a really interesting program out of Atlanta called Engage VC. All the publicly traded companies that are headquartered there, so Delta, UPS, Home Depot, Georgia Pacific, Georgia Power, Invesco, Intercontinental Exchange, Chick-fil-A, and then additionally outside of the area, Goldman Sachs and AT&T. All those companies came together and said, we're really bad at innovating. (laughs) And small companies are really bad at selling to us, so let's come together and put our money into a fund. And so those those corporations are LPs and engage is that outsourced deal flow for them. So there's some really interesting models that are popping up like that, but I would say the two biggest barriers are just there is no framework and process for evaluating early stage deals, far too many horror stories. Uh, I wanted to jump in on that too. Like corporate VCs are only creating them because they're trying to like not get disrupted. So that's like the the the, the pain point that they're trying to focus on there. A lot of the other corporate, a, a lot another thing that corporate VCs do is they'll they'll just tell anyone who throws ten million dollars at something is like, and that's the size of every diversity fund or every like corporate VC fund. Like that is not enough to like be viable in venture capital, and we learned that we were trying to raise a two million dollar fund, then we were trying to raise a ten million dollar fund, then we realized no one can even work full time, or no one can be actually incentivized, or no one can actually take ownership in a company enough with a check size if you're only a ten million dollar fund. So I would say a lot of folks are not necessarily putting the right money to work, and then also in terms of the frameworks point of view, they'll do that ten million dollar fund as a test with no, nothing in place to raise another one, with nothing in place to work with other people in the network. And then lastly, they're too strategic. If Intel does a fund or whatever, Comcast or someone else, they can only invest in this very strong silo, which they technically don't have venture expertise in. They just happen to be in that market and be an older player. And I think they just write checks in and you know, piggyback other folks. And that's not the way to, to win a venture. You kind of got to make a very convicted approach early and then you get the people in your network to jump on it. So I think they've just maybe coming at it at a lack of days call currently, but I know that they're improving. There's a lot of folks that we work with in the space that are improving. And I think it's actually smarter for some of these corporate VCs to really start partnering with other VCs and like sharing information and potentially working together. Andy, your investment oh. from the New York Times is probably corporate venture, right? Yeah, I have, I have different opinions about this. So first of all, I, I, there's this quote by Joe Biden that I actually love that is that all foreign policy is personal relationships, and I like to apply this to all kinds of things. And so corporate venture capital is just, again, very, very different based off of what company you're dealing with. Some corporate VCs invest off the balance sheet, basically meaning that you know, they, can, they don't have a fund. They're just investing straight out of the company's capital. And they're really different strategies based off of whether they have a separate fund or not. Like Comcast Ventures is completely separate from Comcast. And Comcast, invest, Comcast Ventures invests in all kinds of different things. There also happen to be a very good media investor. And Comcast also has the ability to make some relationships happen in media. And Comcast tends to do pretty well getting into media deals. The New York Times has been one of my absolute favorite investors to work with. And the New York Times only makes a few investments every year. But they completely opened up the entire team at the Times. So when we wanted to talk about paywalled content and media, they said, well, why don't you talk to the guy that built the first paywall for the Times like eight years ago? And how about the guy who pretty much bet the entire Times strategy on a paid digital product? Do you want to talk to that guy? Let's get a meeting with him. Do you want to talk to this person, this person, this person? And that's just been immensely valuable to someone who didn't come from the media world. And so I think that going back to the Biden quote, it's just like, Build the relationships. Get to know whether these are people that can actually help your business. As far as, is, you know, is corporate venture capital going to be a great business model for the companies? I would probably say, you know, it's going to be like most things for most large corporations where they're going to probably screw up most of it. Like, I don't know. I think the Times happens to be an, an innovative investor because the Times is an innovative company. Like, I'm skeptical about Chick-fil-A's venture capital arm. <laughs> like, <laughs> that would be a good one. Though. wasn't a fit for us. <laughs> 
It can be risky, though, depending on the industry that you're in. Like, yeah, you know, you, you take money from Goldman Sachs. What is J.P. Morgan going to think right. about that? And will they work with you in the future? And you really have to take that. And maybe it's not an issue for you, depending on the industry. But I know in financial services, huge potential risk to align yourself too closely with a firm like that from a sales and expansion perspective. I want to follow up on that real quick, and then I'll get to your question. It's easy if someone's, like, saying, I found Harlem Capital. I want to send in my deck to look at your website and see where does Harlem Capital focus. As founders... How do you find the aligned investors for yourselves and your companies? I have a list. <laughs> the first thing, uh, one of the biggest mistakes I see founders make when, well, first of all, going back to my privilege question of the first time that you're looking for an investor, you just need someone with money. <laughs> and, and to say anything else I think would be disingenuous to get up here and talk about values alignment and whatever and this and this and this and this when you're just trying to get your first check so your company doesn't die. Usually you're like, I just need the money. I mean, you're probably going to make some mistakes and wish that you hadn't done it, but you're going to have you know, success bias and you're just going to be happy that you had the money. So once you get beyond all of that, I think that it's really important to treat an investor like one of the key, the key hires on your team, especially if they're going to be taking a board seat, especially if they're just a large investor, they're over your major investor threshold. Do they share your values? Is this someone who's going to really push you to grow really fast? Or is this, a company, is this an investor that's going to be more patient? And does that line up with your strategy as a, as a, as a business owner? Is it the right stage? You know, General Atlantic, probably not the right stage for Series A. <laughs> nope. A lot of investors or a lot of entrepreneurs spend a lot of time, like waste a lot of time speaking with investors who are really at the wrong stage. So if that's a relationship building meeting, great. But if it's not, move on. Yeah. I mean, I'd add to that too, to ask a lot of questions. Like, we've had bad experiences, like, you fundraise too. Like, how's your fundraising going? <laughs> Where's that? Is it done? Do you have the money in the bank? Because if not, it's the VC's job to talk to you anyway, even if their fund isn't closed, and even if you don't necessarily 100% fit their mandate. So ask just as many questions to them about all that stuff too to make sure that there's alignment. Definitely. I like to ask my investors questions that make them defensive to see if they're going to be a jerk, like put them on the spot. <laughs> Because if they're going to be defensive about something you ask them in a pitch meeting, you better believe they're going to be defensive when you come to them with some bad news. And you want someone who's going to be on your team. And so, you know, just get a little dig at them. And, like, I test all the investors that I've worked with like that, and it's been really helpful. And the last thing I'll add is helpfulness. If an investor isn't going to help you before they write a check, they're not going to, they're not going to help you after they write a check. The most helpful investor in Holloway is a guy who wrote a $1,000 check. His name's Kevin Lee. He's in, at Pair Ventures. He invested personally. And every time that I ask my investors for help, he's the first guy to text back. And I really wish that I, you know, Kevin could have invested more. Yeah, I was going to say from an investor point of view, like, it is a two-way street. So you should be interviewing the investor in terms of in, whenever you're in that pitch meeting. And what an investor is supposed to do is anything that can get you across whatever finish line you're focused on right now. And if they don't give off that type of thought process or that type of helpfulness, then maybe that's not the right investor for you. And like I said earlier, remember, only investors invest in 1% to 2% of the companies that they see. So it's okay to move on to the next person. Frank Gervais, I'm a local attorney, and I'm realizing that I need to raise my rate because it's not 9 an hour. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm doing Lots myself of free service. information. So I have clients in Florida and Iowa and in traditional places like New York, San Francisco here. I want to talk about terms and processes because for Florida and Iowa, the investors there are hammering the founders on terms, want to see audited financials for a seed stage company. Do you guys foresee that changing as the coasts come more inland in their investments? I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. I hope so. I, I don't know how fast that's going to change. I think it's inevitable that it will change eventually. But it, it, honestly, at least from the Floridian perspective, requires a serious re-education on what early stage investing is like. You know, I've, the deal terms that some of my friends have gotten in Florida are just horrendous. So I think it's just going to take time, but it will change. And it's 100% about educating the investment community down there. And the entrepreneurs to know what to ask for. Yeah. To say this is, this is an untenable ask. I would also say that the, the way that it will change is that there will be a seed investor at some point who will raise a seed fund, like Drive Capital raised to invest in the Midwest for Series A's, and they will say, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to basically tell every entrepreneur that I will invest in your company and I will do seed and I will do no BS terms and everyone else will suddenly have no deal flow. And once that happens, that's when it will start to change. A lot of investors that are already outside are from Silicon Valley or they've been in New York. So they bring very aggressive terms sometimes when they move out to an Ohio or Florida or what have you. So I think it's definitely an education piece that people really need to focus on because it's, it's an epidemic, I think, on like the founder side, pre-seed, seed, and Series A on 
how they don't understand the, the legal ramifications. And because folks on my team have been in private equity and they've owned businesses and they've ran different P&Ls and things of that nature, they've been able to kind of find those misstepping's early when we look at a company. I mean, in terms of financials, I would say still, they don't need to be audited financials, if you will, but like we would love to see a bank statement in some type of financial just because unfortunately some founders are just great salespeople and they may not be building the you know most amazing company that they are selling. And we've been in that round before and like if you don't share contacts and you don't share notes with other folks, then you as an investor won't see that and you'll get burned. So it's, I think it's safety for both. Hi, uh, I would like to know a word for, about like exit. Like you're willing to, or like you're from a VC perspective. Like, what's your opinion about that? Like, when are you willing to sell? Like, you're you're part of the investment, or you're waiting for an IPO? Oh, what's what's our Harlem Capital's focus yeah. on, on the exit process? So for Harlem Capital, we look to get in either in your seed or your Series A. Uh, we're looking to write checks between 250 to a million dollars. We hopefully will follow on and have pro rata rights. In terms of the exit, we want to introduce you to a great investor for your, to lead your A and potentially lead your B and C. And we're fine with acquisition or IPO. I mean, our job is to help you get across the finish line to an exit. There's only two ways the IPO or the acquisition. So if we can connect you with folks who have like a strategic acquisition or we can help you potentially acquire companies or grow fast enough to, to IPO, like we're going to do every single thing that we possibly can to get you there. I mean, that's why we're both here. I had one question on Twitter here. How can other geo markets get in the consideration set of more coastal investors for travel? Yeah, I, I mean, so we like finally got a flight out of Tampa direct to San Francisco, which everyone was like, oh, this is a huge deal. And it kind of wasn't like if an investor wants to get to your area, they'll come there. Like you can have this hoity toity like San Fran VCs aren't, aren't going to take it if it's not a direct flight. I just think that's BS. Like everyone made a huge deal about it in, in Tampa Bay when we finally got a direct flight. I don't know if that's what the question is about, but like, I don't know. I, I don't think that really matters. I think if you're a good company, someone will come and see you or and more likely you go see them too. And then it's only once you get far enough of the diligence that they want to come down and visit. I would say uh, just get, get out of your respective market and like sleep on someone's couch for two weeks in all the places where you want to get investment and take as many coffees as you can. Find that one person who would take a coffee with you and just say, hey, like, if you really enjoy my, my idea and what I'm working on, is there anyone else that you think that I can meet with while I'm in town? And send those emails as if, like, hey, I'm in town for three days. Do you have a chance to meet? Like, make them be on your schedule for that hot period of time because if they're really interested, they'll, they'll jump at it. And, and most investors want to just, like, get up to speed and learn what's going on. So they, won't, they don't want to miss a chance to get a warm intro or someone who's in town working on something cool or get access to knowledge of a market that they don't usually invest in because if you're outside of the coast, to an investor that on my side, like you may have like a more favorable valuation. I might be able to have a bigger equity check that goes further. And then I may be able to, to introduce you to people on the coast and you can get that valuation pop. And then we get to a potential exit down the line. Like that's, investors have to think like that. Two tools are enormously valuable for getting to know strangers. Uh, the first one is Twitter. Like if you don't use Twitter, you should get on Twitter and you should learn how to use Twitter. And the best way to use Twitter is not to follow your friends. Follow people you, you want to know, especially people that are somewhere between like one and 10,000 followers are usually really accessible people and you can just tweet at them, follow them, engage with them, be a normal human being and build a relationship. Don't be a creep. And then if they follow you, you just DM them and say, hey, look, I'm a first time founder or I'm trying to build my business outside of Silicon Valley. I would love to just like, do you have 15 minutes to hop on the phone and I'd just love to pick your brain. If you do that with 50 people, I guarantee you'll have 15 phone calls. And if you don't have 15 phone calls, you should, then you should evaluate what am I doing wrong? Am I being a creep? And then you should try again. <laughs> Twitter's an amazing tool. Also email, cold email people and in the subject line, first time founder looking for advice. Do that for 100 people, you'll have 15 meetings. I guarantee it but most people won't go through and do the work to figure out someone's email and all of that, but you just have to hustle. Yeah, make it as frictionless as possible. Like, meet them wherever they need to be at. Like, be in their city, be at the coffee shop that's right around from the headquarters of their company. It's like, hey, I'm in town for the next three days. If you have 15 minutes in the next 72 hours, like, I would love to just be able to, to get your ear. And then also on the Twitter spot, folks are on social media more than they're texting and emailing. 
and the amount of people who hit me up on Twitter that will never return anything in any other social platform or any other communication is just it's weird, but that's just how the world is right now. And so we have to be able to be agile and adapt. I saw Kara Swisher tweeted at her like her screen time, and Kara Swisher was on Twitter for 15 hours in the last like seven days or something like that. So you just think about these people are staring at this tool, and you can actually build these relationships. It's pretty incredible. Awesome. Well, if you guys enjoyed this, we have conversations like this on Upside every week. We'd love for you guys to check it out. Founders all over the country doing all kinds of different industries. For now, we're going to stick around after this for as long as they won't kick us out. And if you can please join me in giving a hand to our panel. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's guest. So shoot us an email at hello at upside.fm or find us on Twitter at Upside FM. We'll be back here next week at the same time talking to another founder in our quest to find Upside outside of Silicon Valley. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please email us or find us on Twitter and let us know. And if you love our show, please leave us a review on iTunes. That goes a long way in helping us spread the word and continue to help bring high quality guests to the show. Eric and I decided there were a couple things we wanted to share with you at the end of the podcast. And so here we go. Eric Hornung and Jay Klaus are the founding parties of the Upside Podcast. At the time of this recording, we do not own equity or other financial interest in the companies which appear on this show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinions of Duff & Phelps LLC and its affiliates, Unreal Collective LLC and its affiliates, or any entity which employ us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. We have not considered your specific financial situation nor provided any investment advice on this show. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week.